Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 13. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 that God has put eternity in our hearts. Every one of us has a sense, whether we want to suppress that thought or not, that there's more to this life than what we see. There's an afterlife. There's an eternal life. I thought it was fitting that I would quote C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity, where he says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who fought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, Lewis says, that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth, quote, thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. So last time we were here, we talked about John 15, about abiding in the vine and us abiding in Jesus. And one of the things that Jesus said would come is, he said, your fruit will remain. Your fruit will have eternal significance. Amen. It's not going to pass away like so many just good deeds that are done by, this, by society or by a government or by an organization. But for you and I, we can have fruit that lasts forever for the glory of God. So we talked about how do we abide last time. We talked about how it's connected to our to, to our understanding of the Word of God. Jesus, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. So we talked about how important it is that we are connected to the Word because the Word is Jesus. And then we talked about how that it's not, doesn't stop there, that we need to obey. Jesus talked about that if you want to abide, you need to obey the command, just as I have, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and abide in Him. And then we talked about the connection of prayer. That God has caused us to commune with Him in prayer, and that is, a, that is part of abiding. And we talked about how verse 7 and verse 16 are linked together. That our abiding and our prayer life brings fruit, and the fruit that God wants from our lives is connected to answer prayer. So I want to talk tonight about the fourth thing that we didn't touch on last time concerning a body in Christ, and that is that Jesus says, when he's making this understanding, this analogy by many commentators, they believe that they had left the upper room and they were passing on to the way of the Garden of Gethsemane, and they probably were literally walking among a vineyard when Jesus was bringing this illustration. And as they're going, he's saying, I'm the vine, you are the branch, I'm the true vine. And, and, and that, in that analogy that he's revealing, he says in there also that a part of that and his commandment is that we love one another. Correct. We're in John 13. John 13. So I want us to read together right now. This aspect. Now, if you have a title, if you want a title for this message, it is Leaving a Legacy of Love. Jesus could speak with authority in chapter 15 and later in chapter 13 because he lived it. Our authority comes by our integrity and living what we preach. And so in chapter 13, verse 1, look what it says with me. I want us to look at this one verse together. We talked about the uniqueness of John, and so much of John is just in the final hours of Jesus' life. I mean, chapter 13, is, these are the final hours before he, he reaches the cross and then the resurrection, almost halfway through the book. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Observe that this was a central goal and desire of Jesus our Lord. 
that he would love to the end. Let us be reminded that he was loving imperfect people. He was loving disciples who had a temper problem. Lord, should we call fire to come down on them? You don't know what spirit you're of. Does anybody here have know someone that has a very bad temper problem? You're called to love them. Or their unbelief. I mean, they saw how many miracles and they still didn't get it. And Jesus still loved them in the face of their consistent unbelief. Or their childish immaturity or their selfish ambition. I mean, James and John sending their mom to, to ask Jesus that I, we want to sit on your right and we want to sit on your left. Come on, that's some selfish ambition going on there. And Jesus loved them. You know anybody has some selfish ambition that you know? They're always wanting and looking out for themselves and trying to up somebody else, maybe in your workplace. Jesus says, love them as I have loved them. Insensitivity. I mean, these disciples were insensitive. I mean, you have this woman who's pleading with Jesus, come and, and heal my daughter. And she's broken. She knows Jesus is the only answer. And all his disciples can say, Lord, send her away. Jesus loved his disciples. Or how about their prejudice? Not even wanting to go through Samaria. The prejudice they had against the Gentiles. Jesus loved them. You know anybody in your life that's got prejudice? People got a problem because of the way of someone else is from another culture, another color? Love them. And then on top of that, Jesus in, it, in their midst, and he knows it, there's a thief. He knows that Judas is stealing from the purse. You ever been stolen from? Has anybody ever been stolen from before? It's not a good feeling. It's a real sense of betrayal, just in that. And then think about it, that, that this one that Jesus invested in for three years in love, unconditionally, betrays him with a kiss. But Jesus loved Judas till the end. There's something very sobering about reflecting on the legacy that you and I will leave. What legacy are we going to leave? Now, as we, if we have breath here, if there's things in your mind that you're sorrowful, that, you're, that, that even now that you know are not right, the hope is that you and I can repent today and we can leave the legacy that God wants us to leave. Can I get an amen to that? There's always hope with Jesus. But we still need to, be, we need to be circumspect. We need to be self-effacing. We need to ask ourselves, what kind of legacy am I leaving? What am I going to be known for? And so if Jesus is a, the author and the finisher of our faith, which we know he is, and he saw this as a very determinative goal of his life, I submit to you it must be the same in ours as well. And so in and, and speaking to this, I want to say two things. First of all, I want, to, I want to address what hinders love. What hinders love. And this isn't just natural obstacles. Okay, there are, there's a natural element that keeps us from loving people. But I also want us to understand tonight, there is a spiritual component that's huge to this. Because this is so central to Christ being manifest in the earth. That the enemy is doing all he can to keep us from being filled with the love of God. So we've got to recognize that this is real warfare. It's a love war. We must be victorious. So what hinders this love? So I want to address a couple things within that. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is addressing the last days. And he's talking about what's going to come. And he says in verse 9... Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, 
and will hate one another. There's a progression here. They'll be offended, they'll betray, and they'll hate. I believe that we need to address, brothers and sisters, in this day and age of 2018, the spirit of offense. Jesus says, this is going to be a mark of the last days. Can you and I think of a time in our own lifetime when there is not more a spirit of offense in our society? It is all over the place. Everyone's being offended by everything. But it should not be true of the people of God. So where does this offense come from? Where do we get offended? I submit to you that it comes from a couple of things. First of all, there's a root of pride in it. Because I am more concerned about what you've done against me than me trying to figure out if there's another component, another variable, and what's going on in your life. That is a root of offense. It's pride. It's looking out for me. Getting back to sin. Remember, we talked about sin can be remembered by its middle letter. That's what sin is. It's all about I. It's all about me. And so, the offense often is rooted in pride. Also, there's a sense of control. It's out of my... This situation is out of my control. And then lastly, there's a lot of offense that's met in unmet expectations. We have expectations on people, and when they're not meant, that offense can come into our hearts. So as a Christian, how do we counter this? It can go in the the home, it can go in the workplace, it can go outside with your neighbor. Friend, I'm going to tell you, this is spiritual. It's not just natural. The enemy is trying to plant within you and I a spirit of offense. He wants us to be offended because what somebody did against us. So how do we combat this? And I believe a central foundational component is surrendering it to God. Just giving it to the Lord and laying it on His altar. And having the mentality that I am a slave. I'm a servant. I ask you tonight, do servants have expectations on other people? No. They just do what they're told to do and they leave the rest to whatever, however it falls. Now that doesn't mean that we don't speak the truth. If someone did something wrong, we have a responsibility to say and articulate the truth. But we cannot change their heart. We come to them in the spirit of love and we, re- we leave the results to God. Can I get an amen to that? So whether you're dealing with someone who's passive aggressive, or someone who's just outrightly verbal, either way, there's been a spirit of, you just have to give that to God and say, Lord, this is in your hands. But I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to let that enter my heart. I'm going to choose to love. A sign of spiritual maturity can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in this area. Because one of the aspects of this is we expect when we give it to be reciprocated back to us. If it's not, there's offense. So the sign of spiritual maturity, you can see it clearly in Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says in verse 14, Now for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. See that? He's going after the relationship, after the person. He desires that. And then he says, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you and less I am loved. Wow. That is spiritual maturity. I'm going to love you even if you don't love me back. I'm going to love you even more if you love me less. Friend, that the world cannot produce. That is the love that comes from the throne of God. 
Second of all, in this category of what we need to guard ourselves that hinders love is what Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 24. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, Jesus says in verse 11, verse 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Love is connected to purity. John says in 1 John, Behold what manner of love He has bestowed upon us, that we would be called the children of God. The world doesn't receive us because it didn't receive Him. And then John goes on to say, And it will not be able to appear what we will be like, but we will be like Him when we see Him. But we will see Him as He is. And then John says what? Everyone who has this hope in Him or her purifies themselves even as he is pure. See that, that response, that connection of love and purity. So what we feed ourselves will, will either sensitize us or desensitize us to love. Proverbs 23, 7, you guys know, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, that is who he is. It matters what you and I meditate upon. It matters what you and I feed ourselves with. The enemy is like a puppet master. He is constantly trying to create scenarios and trying to get situations that will push buttons to trigger emotions so that they begin to be subject to their emotion, their soulish emotions, rather for the children of God that we are being controlled by the Holy Spirit. So this is why it says in the book of Proverbs, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man do not go lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. Listen, friend, you don't have, the, we don't have to sit next to an angry person. You can put it on the internet, you can put it in a movie, and you can just sit with an angry man as you're watching violence. And that will come into, you'll get a snare for your soul. I mean, listen, listen to even to the news. Listen to the rhetoric of the, of the political world. It's full of offense and anger. And, 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 and what the enemy wants us to do is to enter into that. To enter into that jargon. No, we are called to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We're above this. We're not standing for a certain party within our government. Or we're not going to die on the hill for our president. We're dying for Jesus. And Jesus never leads you down the wrong path. And Jesus will never tweet something that's offensive. Jesus never fails. Can I get an amen? amen. Let's put our hope in Jesus. Listen, friend, I, I, I was thinking about a seminar that I went to because I've been a, I've been, I was a welcomed and accepted to be part of the Billy Graham Rapid Response Team. And there's different seminars and conferences that you can take. And so I chose to take this one by this, this doctor. Her name is Tina, up in the area of uh, Valdez, I think it was, North Carolina. And I went up there for it. And this woman is, as many times, is the, the one that's chosen to be one of the first responders to school shootings. So Sandy Hook and a lot of the school shootings, that she's one of the first ones to go. So she's teaching this seminar on how you respond in those, those moments of trauma. And, and one of the things that caught my attention was, what she was sharing was, that now, I guess the psychologists have caught up and they've realized, and now they get right down to the nitty gritty. And one of the things they're asking the kids that are causing these traumas are, one of the first questions they're asking is, what were they watching? What are they doing on their own time? And what they've discovered, even scientifically, is that the optic nerve there is no filter that goes right to your brain. Think about that. There's no filter. And so, if you're, if you're feeding yourself on that, and that's what they're saying, they're saying these kids, that one of them, I forgot which example it was, that systematically had no pride or gun experience, is systematically shooting people in a very specific way. How is that possible? Because they've been playing the video game. In fact, one of the books that this woman, uh, Tina, referred to, 
that does a lot of traveling. He's the lieutenant colonel, retired lieutenant colonel. His name is David Grossman. He wrote a book called Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. And the whole point is the whole media and all that and the entertainment that has just caused this desensitization to, to, to sin and to violence. And it's desensitizing people to love and to be compassionate. We need to be filled with love, and that comes out of a pure heart. Amen. As I was praying tonight, this, is, this, this phrase came into my spirit, and I want to give a testimony to back this up. What came into my heart as I was praying tonight is, is when we fail to love, we miss the opportunity to see God's glory and lives impacted for the kingdom. When we fail to love, we miss the opportunity to see the glory of God and the opportunity to have his kingdom impact a life or a situation. Let me tell you a time that I almost missed it. When my family and I were called to work in Pine Ridge among the Native Americans, I had such a baptism of love for these people that I had never met. But I didn't know what I was coming up, to, up against. I didn't know, but the Lord knew, and he filled me with his heart. When we got to Rapid City, before we moved to our final destination in Hot Springs, we were in a church that had seen many missionaries go down there. And they didn't last long. And they said, wait, did you know that it's called, that area is called a missionary graveyard? And then I found out that the average life expectancy of a missionary there was six months. Why? Well, I, I remember when I went into it, I was, I was just loving on everybody down there. I was loving on this person. I'm going over and play. I'm so full of love. And I'm just going, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm like, okay, there's some breakthrough, but there's, there's still, there's just, what's going on? I'm not seeing it, you know. And so I begin to fast and pray, and I'm like, God, what is going on? I, I, I know there's more. I feel like, you know, there's some, but there, there's, there's not much. So, Lord, I'm, I'm praying, crying out, Lord, show me your strategy. And as I'm fasting and praying, after some days and weeks go by, I will never forget, I can tell you where I was driving when the Lord spoke to me. And he showed me a vision. I'm driving down, and I hear and I see, and he says to me, give more hugs. And I thought... Lord, that's it? It's like, that's your strategy? And, and, and that's literally what I said to him. I said, that's it? And when I said that, then I had a vision. And I was embracing one of them. And as I was doing that, he had a knife. And he was stabbing me in the back at the same time. And he said, you hug them even when they're doing this to you. And then I said, oh, that's your strategy. That was sobering. Let me tell you, friend, I've never been so slandered in my entire life. People that were saying they love me to my face were being the nicest people you'd ever thought were completely, vindictively, maliciously slandering me behind my back to get me away. I've never seen anything like it. It was spiritual. It was eye-opening, and my reputation, by all appearances, was nothing. I had to constantly lay my reputation on the altar, and that's what all of us have to do in this place. Your reputation must be laid down at the feet of Jesus. Don't try to defend yourself. Don't try to defend your reputation. Give it to the Lord. That is a, that's a process of maturity, that you just relinquish your reputation. I'm going to tell you, friend, it was hard. And on top of that, there are all kinds of witchcraft is coming against us. I don't, I don't want to go into that aspect of spiritual warfare. But let me tell you, the person that I thought was the most one that I could trust and end up being the one that was the biggest betrayer. And that was the one the Lord kept saying, love, love. And there were others. There were others as well. i never forget when I went back to this one guy's house. And I said, listen, I... I'm hearing some things that you're saying about me. And he came out, and he was truthful. And you know what he said to me? He said, wait, every other missionary that comes in here, 
They run away when that happens, but you came back. I don't know how to take that, but yes, that's true. I did come back. And it was like this, it was like this thing of like, you know, I admit what I've done. And it's good that you came back and, and there was all of a sudden a sense of respect that happened because of that. And it continued to go on like that. I remember going into a, a young lady teenager's house with her grandma. We ministered there in that area. And she would cuss us out. She would be fuming mad. And the Lord kept saying, just love. And I would go back, and it would be another onslaught. And after a while, you're going, you know. And then I'll never forget, after, I don't know how many times, I go into the house again, and her whole countenance has changed. And she's talking to us, and like we're her best friends. It's like, it's mind-blowing. And as I began to leave, I don't even know how to take it. I began to go out to the car, and she follows me, my, my friend out there, just going on and on. And, and finally, he said, what's going on? I mean, before you, and all of a sudden, she says, you know, I thought that you guys were fake like all the rest, but you kept coming back, and I see that you're real. The Lord led me to a man there who was known as one of the most feared fighters on the reservation. I went into his trailer one time, and his cousin, who I'd never met, was there as well. And his cousin was exactly my size. 6'6", 240, 50 pounds, built just like me. I didn't know who he was. I found out later he was one of the most feared men on the entire reservation for the way he hurt people and done worse. I'm sitting there trying to be Jesus to this guy that met his other cousin. And this guy I've never met, this guy is my size, he's sitting over here. And I, I'll never forget it. But see, this is what I want to say. That morning, as I'm sitting before the Lord, this is why we need, we, we, we need to ask God for his rhema word in our lives. Our, his, he wants to give us daily bread. He wants to give us instruction in the morning. Amen. And I was waiting on God, saying, Lord, what's your word? And I heard the Lord say, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. I'm going, okay, that's, that's the simple, that's similar to the mount. I, 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 I didn't know what was coming. I was like, oh, I mean, okay, Lord. So I'm coming, and here I am in this situation. And this guy, who I've never met, is sitting there. And he turns his body, and he faces me. Now, I've been in some, some precarious situations as a missionary. I know when someone's bluffing many times, and I know when someone's not about to bluff. And he turns to me and he says, do you know where you are right now? And what he was saying was that I'm on a reservation, and the law ain't the same like it is out there. And he turns to me, and I can feel the rage in this man. I, I, I can feel murder. And he turns to me and he says, I feel like cutting you open. And he leans towards me and his eyes, friend, it's murder. I've been in that situation before. I know when someone is just saying they're angry and they want to fight. And then I've been in a situation where I know someone wants to kill. He's looking into me and he says, I'm going to cut you open. And he's reaching for something at that point. Now that moment, I got a choice to make. Now the flesh, the flesh rose up. I want to be honest. Okay, we all have that, that moment. That's the point of decision. This flesh is like, bring it! But that's not me. My, my, I'm to turn the other cheek. Amen. That's not, I'm not to defend myself. Now if you mess with my wife or my kids, that's another story. You're not going to like that weight. But for me, myself, I don't have to defend myself. So at that moment, as adrenaline is rushing to my body, and he's leaning towards me, the Holy Spirit speaks, love your enemies. If we're not sensitive, friend, I'm telling you, I could have missed it. I, I'm telling you, what would have happened if I responded in the flesh? See, if I fail to love, I fail to see the glory of God. And something bad can happen. At that moment, the Holy Spirit rose up in me, and I turned to that man, and I said, 
you can, you can kill me, and I'll love you anyways. As soon as I said that, friend, it's like his eyes rolled back in his head. Literally, he was like, he, like something just came over him. I mean, it was, it was wild to see. And he turned to his cousin, and he said, did you just hear what he just said? And I said it again. And I'm telling you, friend, it just went boom, like something just supernatural came into the room. But listen to what happened. I can still feel something pulsing off of this guy. Finally, I'm like, this isn't productive. I, get, I stand up to leave. He stands up and he stands right in front of my face. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I said, my time here is done. He said, no. He says, You're gonna, I want you to take me to Wounded Knee. You're going to drive me to Wounded Knee. Now, if you don't know about Wounded Knee, this is a significant place. This is the last place that the Indian Wars took place. It's the massacre that happened when the white men, the white army, 7th Cavalry, butchered and killed kids and wives and, and, and unarmed men. It's, it was an atrocious, horrific aspect of our history. And it's a, it's a seed, and understandably so, of a lot of anger within their midst. I mean, if you were, were you then, would you not be like that as well? I mean, that, that's symbolic of you killing us unarmed, mowing us down. He says, I want you to drive me there. Now, logically, this is not wise. But the Lord says to me, do good to those who hate you. I said, all right, let's go. We get in my truck, same truck I have out there in the parking lot. And he says, take me over to this house. I'm going to get a pack of cigarettes. He's breathing threats to me of still this attitude that he's going to hospitalize me or worse as we're going to get his cigarettes. When he gets out, i I like, okay, Lord, no, this, this is your truck. This is your time. I come, I, I, I bind every unclean thing. That's, I just begin to pray. I said, Lord, come into this place. And I felt the presence of God come. I felt peace come. I'm driving on my way to Wounded Knee. And he starts still threatening me, but I'm feeling the peace of God because I've committed it to the Lord. And friend, I want to just testify to you tonight that as I'm driving down the road, the corner of my eye, as he's still breathing threats, tears start coming down his face. And he says, you want to know why I'm the explicit of explicit of worst guy on this, on this reservation? And he begins to open his heart of how he was physically abused day after day by his, his dad who was a Marine. I mean, how do you explain that but by the power of the Holy Spirit? We drive up to Wounded Knee, and I'm telling him, you can be forgiven. He's saying, I can't be forgiven. You don't know what I've done. And I'm saying, yes, you can. We get up to Wounded Knee, and he says, here is fine. And he's, he's going to get out of the car. And I said, before you go, I want to pray for you. And he allows me to pray for him. And friend, this is, this is what God does. I wasn't looking for it. This was not conjured up. As I put my hand on him, the power of God came on me. I started weeping for this man's soul. In his presence, weeping for him. And from that moment on, he looked at me and something broke. And we were friends after that ever since. If we fail to love, we'll fail to have the opportunity to see God's glory. What nurtures love? We said what hinders it, what nurtures love? Number one, there's just three small things I want to say. Number one, obviously, is the Word of God. The Word of God renews our minds so that we, we de deprogram those thoughts and those memories that have fueled offense and violence and everything that's contrary to true, pure love. The Word of God renews our minds. That's why it says in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, things are noble, which things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And if we would just take the time to meditate on 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, can I get an amen? We're going to be impacted. Number two, it goes without saying, but we need to say it. 
We are, our love is nurtured as we pray, as we ask God to fill us with love. This is a biblical prayer. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, he prays that, that he, God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It's beyond our understanding and our intellect. And what does Paul say? That when you're filled with this love, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. I mean, think about that. Who here doesn't want to be filled with the fullness of God? And it comes by us asking to know the height, the depth, the breadth, and the length of his love. I remember there was a guy, a, a prophetic guy that had a vision years ago about a revival, the revival is coming, and I believe, I, I pray it's close. And he said he saw, it was a stage, and there was a big curtain, and he was by, one, the, 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 the curtain was r rising up to show what was going to be displayed, and there was one of those old-fashioned, you know, those power things, that you, the, the big switches that you pull down to, to send the electricity through the whole building. And he was just about to pull the power, and he heard a voice say, Don't pull the power yet! You're not grounded! And as he got that revelation, the Lord spoke that we're grounded in love. Love and truth. Friend, if God gives us power, if we see His miracles, and we're not walking in love, we will walk in pride. We will walk in carnality. We will treat it as a common thing rather than reverence and holiness. We will be open to deception. Everyone's crying out for power, power. Yes, God wants to give the power, but are you and I grounded? Are we grounded in the Word and are we grounded in His love? So this is the last thing I want to say as a word of encouragement and as an application and a challenge that we nurture love by intentionality. We need to be intentional. It doesn't just happen by osmosis. We have to make a decision to love. And so I want to challenge you this week. One of the most powerful things that we can do as a people of God is to speak words of encouragement and speak life to one another. So I want to challenge you that some different ways, you can do like one each day of the week, five days. Would you, would you consider this week sending out a text? But I, I, don't, I want to encourage you, friend, don't just send out a word of encouragement. I want to encourage you to ask God to give you his heart for that person and to even give you a word for them. Pray, pray and ask the Lord, what, how? Can I speak a word of, and it might be short, that's fine. But ask the Lord, God help me to send out this word. What would you want, me, what would you want them to know? So a text one day, an email, another day. Oh, we're going old school here, a letter. Come on, a letter. Letters are powerful. Phone and in person. I want to challenge you and encourage you to do that. So this is how I want to close our time. I want us to repent. Individually, if it, if it doesn't apply to you, but corporately. I want us to repent for the spirit of offense that has been allowed into the church. I want us to repent for things that we've allowed in our lives that has desensitized us to the love of God. As a church, as a church. I was speaking collectively, corporately, <clears throat> even beyond this building, even beyond other churches. I'm going to make even the Church of America. And I want us 
to ask the Lord to fill us with his love and that through that, for I believe this, that if we would have the heart of the Father, God is going to be able to entrust people to us that he knows he wants to transform. But it's going to be only by his power because it's going to be difficult. Come on. It's not going to be easy. Jesus says, if you only love those who love you back, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do the same. I want us to ask God to fill us with his love. That even those that would, the enemy would try to use to put an offense in our heart or try to push that button, we will just say, bless them, Lord. I, I, I want your heart right now for them. Give me your heart. Help me to pray and to love them. So can we pray right now? Can we repent of that together? And let's believe the Lord to replace it with his love and let us be vigilant to seek that love more and to guard ourselves from those things that would try to hinder that love from flowing through our lives.